is both a challenging and a worthwhile thing for us to do, as, as Lourdes mentioned. These are two areas of research, two important, well-established areas of research. Um, they have a lot in common, but haven't been talking to each other much. So this is, as far as I know, the first public talking to each other. But what makes it challenging is we're not really sure what we're supposed to say. So, <laughs> so anyway, just so you know, set the expectations. I'm going to be talking about some areas of cross-linguistic influence, including some, some findings and some studies and, and um, principles that I think are relevant to statistical learning. And then Philip will tell us a little bit later whether they really are or not. But, um, the first part I'm going to try to go through kind of quickly because um, I have only 30 minutes. And I, I want to just kind of start by making sure that, that we have a common background. A lot of this information at the beginning you already know, but anyway, it's a narrative. Cross-linguistic influence, as you probably know, is something that people have been aware of for thousands of years, as long as people have been learning languages. And it's been written about as long as people have been writing. The ancient Greeks wrote about you know, foreigners who sounded strange, and, and it seemed like they were referring to foreign accents, as well as, well as uh, cross-linguistic influence in the way that they framed what they were saying. By the 1800s, cross-linguistic influence had become a subject of of scholarly inquiry, and the, uh, the German scholar Wilhelm von Humboldt wrote about it. He talked about how, how our native languages shape our worldviews and how those worldviews can be carried over into our use of another language. Also in the 1800s, there was an American researcher by the name of William Dwight Whitney who talked about how cross-linguistic influence can be found in language contact phenomena, and how when two languages come together, they tend, one of those languages, if not both, tend to change due to cross-linguistic influence. Most of the research that had been done up through the, let's say, the first part of, of the 1900s was um, scholarly, but it involved a lot of um, observation and introspection. Perhaps the, the most important empirical study of cross-linguistic influence, as well as bilingualism and sociolinguistics, um, was completed and published in 1953. This was Euro Weinreich's book, Languages in Contact, and it's, today it, re it remains a classic, something that's important to all three of those different areas of research. Four years later, Robert Lano um, published a book called Linguistics Across Cultures, and, and this, again, kind of returned to observations as well as uh, some introspection, but it, it's actually quite a fascinating book where Lado points out a number of things. On page two, he says, for example, individuals tend to transfer the forms and meanings and the distribution of forms and meanings of their native language and culture to the foreign language and culture. And focus on the word distribution. I think this is actually where we see some, some overlap between cross-linguistic influence and statistical learning. I'll come back to that a little bit later. It turned out, however, that most researchers kind of overlooked what Lado said. The, the very interesting things throughout his book that he said, and focused instead on what was <laughs> framed as the contrastive analysis hypothesis, even though Lado himself actually never used those terms, contrastive analysis. But he did say that, um, that learning can be more difficult when the native language is very different from the target language. This led to some studies, some, some of the first empirical studies in cross-linguistic influence and second language acquisition in the 1960s. There weren't that many empirical studies, but some of them showed, they were looking at errors, learner errors, and found that cross-linguistic influence actually did not account for a very large percentage of those errors. So this kind of led to the, this was kind of the beginning of the downfall of, of transfer, at least for a, a time. There was another book published in, in 1957 that also kind of contributed, at least indirectly, to the, the hard times that the transfer research had. And it wasn't just this book by Noam Chomsky, but also Noam Chomsky's reaction to this other book that was published in 1957 <laughs> called Verbal Behavior by B.F. Skinner. And you probably all know the story. Uh, B.F. Skinner talked about how we can account for language acquisition, first language acquisition in particular, uh, as a matter of uh, developing behaviors and, and habits. Two years later, Noam Chomsky wrote a, a very critical, scathing critique of, of B.F. Skinner's book. It was published in the journal Language. And um, it, 
that pretty much led to the downfall of behaviorism, and it kind of took transfer research with it because a lot of people associated transfer with the idea that transfer means you know taking your L1 habits and turning them over into the use of an L2. Some of the researchers during the 1960s, well, one of them included Leonard Newmark, who in 1966 as well as 1968 introduced what later became known as the ignorance hypothesis. He recognized that, yes, transfer does happen, cross-linguistic influence does happen, but it really doesn't happen that often, it only, and it only happens in unfortunate circumstances where the learner is being forced to produce the second language before he or she has been properly prepared to do so. For example, has to express meanings but doesn't yet have the word or the grammar to do so, so therefore he or she will fall back on the, the native language just to help him or her, her out in that situation. Just a few years later, um, DeLay and Briggs published a series of studies, as you probably know, um, most of them dealing with the acquisition of grammatical morphemes by child second language learners, mostly of learners of English. And uh, in all of, I believe it was in every single one of their publications, they emphasized how small a role transfer had in, in the errors that the learners produced. In one of their studies, they, they found that transfer might account for as few as 3% of the errors that learners produce. Stephen Krashen followed up on this um, in his famous monitor model from 1977, as well as a little bit later, he also kind of returned to the idea of the ignorance hypothesis. And he really emphasized that, yes, this is true, that transfer really is, is negligible, not so interesting either. One example from his monitor model theory is the natural order hypothesis, which is the idea that certain grammatical morphemes have to be acquired before others, and that the learner's native language does not alter that order at all. Well, because of such influential researchers, Stephen Krashen, DeLay and Bert, and other people, saying that transfer is negligible and uninteresting, it kind of led to a period in transfer research during the 1970s that kind of looked like this, I guess. For Actually, to be more honest, it was probably a little bit more like this, because there were some signs of life. And in fact, um, the reason why there were signs of life is because of these five researchers. I'll just refer to them as the guardians of the transfer galaxy. <laughs> Many of them continued to conduct research on transfer during the 1970s or, or in the 80s to revive um, what had been lost. These included Larry Selinker, Holkan Greenbaum, uh, who was a Finnish researcher, Eric Kellerman, who was a British researcher but, but um, spent his entire career in the Netherlands, Roger Anderson, an American researcher, and Terence Odlin, an American researcher. Here's what Larry Selinker did, and I think this has direct relevance to statistical learning. He kind of returned to this idea that Mado had, had introduced earlier, which is that transfer affects not just the forms and meanings that learners produce, but also the distribution of those forms and meanings. And what Selinker did is he took this idea, he looked, um, he was investigating Hebrew-speaking learners of English, and he was interested in their adverbial placement within sentences, so where you put adverbs and where you put adverbial phrases. And uh, he first looked at what they did in their native language of Hebrew, and, and he accounted for, so you know, of course, adverbial placement is something that's common to probably all languages. In English, you might have a sentence like, I ran to the store, and then you have uh, an adverb like quickly, and you can put quickly in many different places. You can say, quickly I ran to the store, I quickly ran to the store, I ran quickly to the store, I ran to the store quickly. Well, each of those particular slots or locations for the adverb um, kind of has its own characteristic frequency. Some of those slots are far more frequent than others. And what he was trying to say is that these slots in Hebrew, first of all, they're highly contextual, so that you won't find the same pattern with all adverbials in all sentences. It really depends on the meaning of the sentence, the type of sentence, and what the adverb itself means. So it's highly context-dependent. The second thing that he pointed out was that that this seems to be shared knowledge across native speakers of Hebrew, that they all kind of share the same idea about what's the most 
uh, dominant position. What's the second most, the third most, and so forth. And then the other thing, as it relates to cross-linguistic influence, is that he found that Hebrew-speaking learners of English tend to transfer those frequencies from Hebrew into their use of English. So the location that's dominant in Hebrew also turns out to be the dominant position in English, regardless of whether it was an error or not. So I think that was quite fascinating. Um, and let's talk about what some of these other great transfer researchers did. I'm going to change this to a a vertical <laughs> alignment, and then we'll get rid of Selinker and Odlin. Not because they're not important, but I want to focus on what these other three did. These other three, to me, this is really fascinating. Um, and it took me a while before I realized this. What they did is they basically took a transfer, which had up to this point been investigated as an independent variable that affects something that's more interesting, like you know errors. And they, they changed the focus. They said, um, let's not look at transfer as an independent variable, but as a dependent variable that has its own independent variables or explanations, triggers, and constraints. For, for Ringbaum and Anderson, the constraints they were mainly interested in were cross-linguistic similarity. And in Anderson's case, he was particularly interested in the perception of similarity and how that affected whether transfer would happen or not. Eric Kellerman, um, you might know his famous break study from 1978 where he takes the verb break and of course you can use it in various different meanings like you can say um, the, the glass broke or I broke my leg or, or you could use it more metaphorically like she broke my heart, something like that. Well he came up with a list of, remember that Eric Kellerman was working in the Netherlands, he came up with a list of 15 or 16 different kinds of meanings, he had sentences for each meaning. And he asked um, Dutch speaking learners of English to, to indicate whether they thought that meaning would translate, transfer into English, whether they could actually translate that sentence directly using the, the English word break. And he found that, that there was large agreement that some of those meanings would transfer directly into English, such as the cup broke and he broke his leg, and some would not translate at all, such as she broke his heart. Now what's, what's interesting is that every single one of the meanings actually translates directly between Dutch and English. But that's not what the learners expected, and, and so Kellerman found, he, he referred to this as transferability, and he also um, used the, the term psychotypology to refer to learners' own perceptions and intuitions about what transfers and what doesn't, and how this can serve as a constraint. This notion might also come up a little bit later in our discussion. So here are just a, a couple of thoughts um, to summarize before I go on to some of the more recent research. First, learners transfer not only forms and meanings, but also the frequencies of those forms and meanings. And second, there are important constraints on how, when, and to what extent learners will make use of prior knowledge. So I'm going to focus on those two ideas and talk about some of the more recent research that's dealt with them. And I, I'm hoping that it will be relevant to our later discussion of the relationship between cross-linguistic influence and statistical learning. So frequency transfer first, and then I'll talk a little bit more about the effects of cross-linguistic similarity. Um, frequency transfer, there have actually been a number of researchers now who have looked at, at frequency transfer, the transfer of frequency, or what Marder called the transfer of the distribution of forms and meanings. A lot of this research has taken place in the context of corpus linguistics, and learner, learner corpus linguistics. Magali Paco is, is someone who's an up-and-coming person. Actually, she's quite well established right now in, in learner corpus research. And uh, she finished her dissertation in 2007, and in 2008, which is the study that I'm referring to, she published um, some of the findings from her dissertation. I'll mention just a few things that I think are important and relevant. She used five subcorpora of the ICL for this study, and the five subcorpora were defined according to the native languages of the individuals who wrote the essays. And the, the ICL is the International Corpus of Learner English. Her analysis focused on their use of multi-word sequences in both their first language and their second language. So 
multi-word sequences like to illustrate this, let us take as an example, let's consider. And she used computational methods to extract these multi-word sequences from, from her data. Now, Polka and Ringbaum and some other people have act, had actually done something similar previously. But she did two things that they hadn't. One was that she actually used inferential statistical tests to see whether the differences between different learning groups were statistically significant. And she found that some of them indeed were. The other thing she did was that she wasn't just looking at the frequencies in their L2, English in this case. She also looked at the frequencies of corresponding multi-word sequences in their native languages. And here's what she found. First of all, she found that multi-word units, which in the L1 were highly frequent, ended up being highly frequent, in fact, often overused in English. Second, she found that, that a number of the differences between the individual L1 groups were statistically significant. And importantly, the third finding was that the differences across those L1 groups corresponded to differences between how they performed in their L1 as well. So again, here it appeared that the frequencies that they were used to producing in their L1 output was transferring into their use of the L2 as well. There was one important caveat, and maybe this will come up a little bit later too, which is that the frequencies in their L2 didn't actually match the frequencies in their one. They were kind of in the same rank order, right? So what was most frequent in the L1 was also most frequent in the L2, but it could be a lot less frequent in the L2 than it was in the L1 or vice versa, right? So those didn't match exactly. So uh, clearly there's something else going on here as well. Well, um, I met Magalia right around that same time and we decided to, to do some research together a little bit later. This was published in 2002 in a book that I edited together with Scott Crossley, right? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry, Scott. <laughs> no, um, what we did in this case, we were interested in the frequencies that learners were producing in the L2, but we were interested in, in looking at how well you could identify the L1s of individual learners based on the frequencies they were producing. So you probably know this already, that in many cases, group tendencies aren't a very good indication of what individuals within that group actually do, right? Group means sometimes are... It's interesting when the group means for different groups are statistically different from one another, but sometimes you have a lot of individuals within those groups that are identical, right? So we wanted to find out whether we could rely on, on the frequencies of n-grams, you know, single words, pairs of words, and then three word units to see if we could, um, how accurately we could identify learners' native languages. In this case, we had 12 subcorpora from the International Corpus of Learning English. And we see the L1s right here, Bulgarian, Czech, Dutch, Finnish, French, and so forth. We had over 2,000 participants or 2,000 texts in the study. And as I mentioned, Earlier, we were looking at n grams, both one gram, actually. So, one grams like made and now, two grams like according to, part of, three grams, it is important, on the contrary, four grams, it seems to me, most of the time. We took the most frequent one grams, two grams, three grams. We took the most frequent 200 of each group and we looked at which ones were most reliable in terms of predicting the learners' L1s. Um, and we also did one that combined all of these things together. These are the results of the combination of all of the different um, of the all of the different types of n-grams: one grams, two grams, three grams, and four grams. So what you see here are the predicted group membership, and then these are the actual L1 groups. And this shows the percentage of texts that were written by Bulgarian speakers that were actually written by Bulgarian speakers. Our percentages ranged from 41.9 for the Italian group all the way up to 68.1 for the Polish-speaking group. The overall accuracy was 54%. And that might not seem very impressive, but when you have 12 different groups and you divide 100 by 12, you get about 8%. That's kind of the baseline chance. And we were getting 54%, which is not bad for just n grams like this, I think. <laughs> 
Um, before I go on, I do want to mention that I did conduct another study with one of Magali's um, colleagues at her university in, in Belgium. And um, we did a, a different kind of analysis that involved over 400,000 features, not just a few hundred like this. And, and we did this with a, a corpus that involved 11 different L1 groups. And our accuracy, classification accuracy in that case was 84%. Which I think is pretty amazing. I mean, that's that's up to that kind of that wow phenomenon. <laughs> where, and, and what I think is really interesting here and important is that um, even though individuals don't always follow group tendencies in terms of means, they're still highly group specific. Their behavior can still be so highly group specific that you can identify with 84 percent accuracy what their native language background is, even when they're relatively proficient. So going back to this study, I want to show you some of the things that we found, or at least one thing. These are some of the reliable features or reliable engrams that we found. A, according to all the time, also, and are able to, and so forth. These are the engrams that were nicely distinguishing between learners from different L1 backgrounds. Here's one thing that I think is interesting. <coughs> Notice that this list includes both all the time and most of the time. Those two things are pretty closely related, right? In fact, sometimes people say most of the time when they mean all the time and vice versa, right? Well, let's take a look at these uh, results here. So this shows both all the time and most of the time. And you see there are some groups like the Dutch speakers and the French speakers who use most of the time, most of the time, right? <laughs> and then other groups like the Czech speakers and the Finnish speakers who use all the time. All the time. <laughs> And it turns out that just those two engrams, all the time and most of the time, do pretty well already at distinguishing between learners from these different groups. That, I think, is quite interesting. Um, let me mention a couple of other studies. One is a, is a series of studies published by Job Sheppens and his colleagues in the Netherlands. The first one is in 2013, another one in 2016, and there's another one in press. Um, I won't talk about those, those uh, studies separately. Each one uses the same database, which is the state exam of Dutch as a second language. And not all the studies use all the same. Um, these are basically test scores. They're, so there are about 50,000 learners. Um, he has test scores for each of them. Um, within that database, there are 73 L1s with at least 20 Learners. So there are actually more than 73 L1s, but there are 73 that have at least 20 learners. He, he conducted some very um, complex statistical analyses to see what was affecting their test scores. And he would take, um, he would control for various kinds of background factors. But this, in his most recent results, he was comparing lexical similarities, phonological similarities between the L1 and Dutch morphological similarities, and then lexical plus morphological plus phonological. Notice they found that lexical, um, lexical similarities between the learners L1 and Dutch accounts for 70% of the variance in the data. That's more than the phonological similarity and morphological similarity. And when you combine all of them, it gives you, it accounts for 80% of the variance. That's pretty major. Well, in his 2016 study, he also looked at uh, so a number of these learners, in fact, most of them were learning Dutch as an L3 and not as an L2. So he took the L2 into consideration, and he found that the effects of the similarity between the L2 and Dutch was not quite as strong as the similarity between the L1 and Dutch, but it was still quite strong. And when you add those effects to these, it accounts for most, I mean, I mean, this is already accounting for most of the variance in the data, but you get pretty close to being able to predict um, at very high levels of accuracy, how well a person is going to be able to learn a language. So, cross-linguistic similarity is very, very important, no question about it. Here's another way of looking at cross-linguistic similarity, which I think is fascinating. Um, it, it involves the use of MRI technology. So this researcher, Kyung Jung Jiang, who is a, a Korean researcher who works in in um, Japan at Tohoku University, published this study with her colleagues in 2007. 
she identified sentences in English, Chinese, Korean, and Japanese that carry the same meaning, 